Welcome everyone to the University of Manitoba Alumni and Friends Virtual Learning for Life series. This is our first of a total of nine weeks. We meet here each week at Wednesday at this time, with the exception to our final session, which will be on Tuesday, June the 30th. And all of our sessions will be posted to our website uh, after at the conclusion of each session. My name is Tracy Bowman. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and a, uh, at the University of Manitoba and a proud UM alumna myself. And I'll be the moderator for this series. We have uh, 635 alumni and friends who've registered for this session from around the world. So thank you very much for joining us today, making this event part of your day, and in general, choosing to stay connected with your alma mater in this way. This program has traditionally been in person, geared towards our seniors, alumni, and friends audience in the Winnipeg area. Uh, but due to our current situation of not being able to get together in groups, we've expanded to all of our 145,000 alumni living in 140 countries around the world to be able to participate. And we've been able to offer this program free of charge to all of our alumni and friends, thanks to the generous sponsorship of one of our affinity partners, IA, IA Financial. Many thanks to them. So just a few housekeeping details before I introduce our speaker today. You're all viewing this webinar on the YouTube link that was sent to you in the confirmation email. And you will be able to see during the presentation, you'll be able to see Dr. Poulin and her presentation. Her presentation will, will, will be about an hour or so, and then we will open it up to questions at the end. You were also sent in that email a link to a website called Slack. We posted it up on YouTube right now. So the reason we've, we've done this is so this is a way for you to be able to ask your questions uh, that I will then be posing to Dr. Poulin at the end there. But also we have four poll questions that we will be asking during the presentation. Of course, your participation in the polls and the Q&A is completely optional. Uh, but uh, it is an interesting way for you to, to, to get that additional engagement through the presentation. Uh, and so with that, I, I encourage you either to open up another window in your web browser, just another page, where you can click on that link there. So you see it's sli.do and the password is 5997. Or alternatively, you could also have a secondary device with you, like a mobile phone or something like that, where you're able to participate. If you want to toggle back and forth between uh, whatever device you're using to see this presentation and then how you participate in the poll. But I'll leave that to your decision as to how you'd like to participate. So as a moderator, I will be able to see all the questions so you can pose your questions and you can choose to either put a name to yourself or choose to be anonymous. Just know that when I make the question live for everybody to see, if you put your name on it, people will see your name there. So that option is yours as well. Uh, I will try to get through as many of the questions at the end as we can, depending on how many there are. Uh, and as I said, I will verbally be, be asking them of Dr. Poulin. So please, do, we do encourage you to ask questions uh, on the topic. So with that, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeanette Poulin, our, our speaker for today. And our topic is Addictions Medicine, Our Provincial Landscape. Dr. Poulin is the Director of Mentorship and the Clinical Enhancement Program at the Max Rady College of Medicine here at the University of Manitoba. She's also the Medical Director of the Addictions Foundation of Manitoba. She's a family physician, author, and advocate for vulnerable populations across Manitoba, particularly those suffering from mental health and addictions illnesses. And she's also a two-time UM alumna. So with that, Dr. Poulin, over to you. Thank you very much, Tracy. I'm just gonna pull up my presentation. And thank you all, first of all, um, to everyone who's attending. Um, I have to say this is a first time experience for myself uh, in terms of a virtual capacity presentation. And so uh, bear with me if there's any uh, technolo technology glitches or sound issues, and we are going to attempt uh, a poll. So it will be uh, an interesting and fun hour and a half that we're going to get to share together. And importantly for me to share an important topic that has become an important part of my life. So as Tracy was saying, uh, I am a family physician and I started out my ventures um, in my hometown, which is Thompson, Manitoba. And what I realized quickly was, you know, whether I was in the emergency department um, or in a clinic setting or walk-in, 
addictions was an issue I was facing in every single domain. And so I had decided to further pursue some of my studies, um, particularly in that area. And uh, since that time, I have gone on into leadership uh, within addictions medicine here in the province and um, help with teaching, mentoring, and uh, obviously sharing my passion uh, with you all today. So, uh, you know, I don't get the privilege of seeing you all in person, but um, I thought I'd start with a little bit of humor, um, a humor with obviously an undertone uh, of seriousness in that uh, we are facing uh, the coronavirus pandemic. And I love this illustration because I feel it depicts quite a bit in terms of addictions. So as you can see, the Heineken beer are very afraid of our coronavirus, be corona beer. Um, this is something that is a reality with addictions that we see on a daily basis, is the stigma um, that lies within addictions as that coronavirus within our health system and largely uh, within our whole society. And so as I go through um, today, I'm gonna talk to you about um, certainly uh, different types of substances. I won't go into detail um, just for time's sake about behavioral addictions, but that is something very important as well. Um, but then importantly talk about some of the underlying issues, some of the stigma that uh, we face and some of the treatment approaches that we're using here in Manitoba. So why do we even talk about this? Um, you know, I'm gonna share a couple of facts and most of these stem from uh, Health Canada and Kai Hai. Um, you know, you might've heard the one in five quote, that's a number that's uh, widely used in Canada in regards to one in five Canadians struggling in their lifetime with a mental health or addictions uh, issue. And so when we think about that comparatively to other uh, diseases or disorders, um, this certainly has a high prevalence. One in seven Canadians age 15 and older have an alcohol-specific related problem. And again, uh, that's quite a high statistic. One in 20 have a cannabis-related concern. And approximately 11 Canadians die every single day from an apparent opioid-related uh, incident, so uh, primarily an overdose. The prevalence of current cigarette smoking, again, in the context of addiction, sometimes we don't think about uh, tobacco, but still importantly, um, having significant in impacts on our health. Um, in 2017, uh, prevalence went up from 15% uh, comparatively to 2015, which was 13%. And, you know, not only do we share with U.S. Uh, hockey and uh, many other uh, types of uh, social, uh, uh, I guess, glamours, um, we also share a lot of the same issues. And uh, when we look at some of our neighboring statistics, um, the U.S. National Survey found that uh, while 21.5% of Americans 12 and older do suffer from a substance use disorder in the year prior to that um, uh, study, only 2.5 million received the care that they need. And I think that's really important because um, what that grossly attests to is uh, people who are suffering with a substance use disorder are not getting that the help or the care that they need. And I always like to say, you know, uh, particularly with the coronavirus right now in terms of immunity, addictions has um, no immunity. We don't have a vaccine and it affects everyone. Uh, it doesn't matter our age, our social class, our race, um, our religion, our culture. Um, every single day I work with people across the spectrum of life uh, dealing with a spectrum of different substance issues. An important caveat here is that when we see these numbers, a lot of these are likely an um, underestimation of the real uh, depth of the problem, certainly because we know that people do not disclose um, things related to their uh, addictions issues like they might uh, with other uh, diseases. And one example of that is um, in Ontario, they did a study and people who um, had responded and noted that if it had a family member who had diabetes or cancer, um, about 50% would disclose that they, they're experiencing this. Um, but if it came to a family or uh, a friend who had addiction or mental health issue, that that um, uh, reduced substantially. And so really important when we think about that. Um, a couple other statistics I wanted to share again, I think they're really important. This is from our Kai Hai. 400 Canadians are hospitalized on a daily basis due to the harms of alcohol or substances. 10 die every day. Uh, and three and four deaths of those that are um, in the hospital are related to alcohol. 
And four in 10 Canadians uh, that are uh, hospitalized also have a mental health uh, condition. And that could include anything from, you know, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia. And again, that relation between uh, uh, addictions and mental health is quite important. So alcohol does contribute to more than half of uh, hospital stays. And while we will speak about opioids and stimulants, which are certainly taking the forefront in terms of acute fatalities, really important to remember that alcohol is still one of our number one substances that we are uh, facing in terms of uh, impacts, both on health and social realms. And um, here on the, on the right side, what you'll notice is that um, in children and youth, we're starting to see more numbers um, in impacts related to cannabis. And so we'll talk about um, that uh, very shortly as well. So to kind of get our kind of our blood flowing, I want to talk a little bit some, about something that's really important and kind of what I alluded to on the first slide with uh, the coronavirus is that we can't talk about addictions without at first addressing stigma. Stigma is something that has plagued addictions for um, uh, many a time, likely its uh, whole historical um, existence. And so if we at least don't acknowledge that, we will never um, help address the full uh, spectrum uh, of the issue that we face. And so when I think of a stigma, like many of you, you'll probably all have kind of our own preconceived definition of what we think uh, substance use stigma is. But what I thought we'd do is we just spend a little bit of time breaking down um, in three categories. So social, structural or system and self stigma. And the reason why this is important is because all of these come into play um, when people are facing uh, the healthcare system to get the help that they need. And when we think about social stigma, this is certainly things that um, impact us from uh, movies that are playing, uh, advertisements or ads uh, that are playing, um, you know, the societal context that says what is okay and what's not okay. And so um, many people will encounter this message um, that come that comes to them, and they might be suffering um, a little bit in silence due to some of that impact. And when then when we think about the structural or system uh, stigma, this is things that a person might face when they enter into the healthcare system, and that could be, you know, something from. And I think I think of often, for example, when I've worked in the emergency departments, and you know. Uh, you know, say Johnny comes in for the sixth time that day or sixth time that, that week seeking out their opiates or their benzos, um, you know, sometimes uh, they're met with, oh, Johnny's here again, or, um, oh, it's just a substance user or an addict, someone who's uh, searching uh, to get their pills. And so that does unfortunately have ramifications on the care that that individual gets and importantly affects uh, their confidence and um, uh, their likelihood on continuing um, and accessing care. And then the self-stigma, and this is something that sometimes we don't think about, um, but certainly that many people do have, and that could be shaped and formed by their past experiences, the culture or um, the family they grew up in or uh, the religion uh, that uh, they attend to. And it can um, certainly paint a preconceived notion um, for them, or ethically tell them what is right or wrong, i.e., you know, I'm a bad person, I'm a failure, I'm undeserving, I'm not worthy because I have a substance use disorder. And so as you can imagine, people have many of these layers um, that could exist for them. So when we think about stigma, like I said, there's these definitions and certainly these areas that I have explained in terms of levels that impact. But one way I find that is really important is we don't always appreciate that unless we experience it ourselves. And so what I'd like to do at this time is um, start by doing a little bit of a poll uh, to help us to understand our own bias and our own stigma when it comes to substance use disorder. So what I would like is if you have um, the opportunity uh, to pull up your screen or your other your other cell phone or whatever it is that you're going to respond the poll. And Tracy, I will ask that you um, pull up the poll. Our first question is going to be uh, this scenario. So all of us, I know we're all all around the world, and maybe it's you know evening for someone and afternoon for another, and uh, perhaps morning, but if you could imagine with me, I'm going to take us a little way on a venture. We're all going to go out tonight. We're going to celebrate together because woohoo, we're uh, alumni graduates. And so um, we have to engage in a substance. So what you see before you, and I'm not going to share 
at first glance what these specifically are. But I want you to look at them and I would like you to vote. You have to engage in something. Tonight, It's you have to have some kind of substance in one of these four. I'd like you to vote for which substance you're going to take tonight, whether it's A, B, C, or D. So if you could all please take your um, poll up and please uh, vote. And I just voted too, by the way. So I see, I see people are still voting. So I'm just kind of following along here. So I'm already noticing a trend and I'm just kind of looking as people are still continuing to vote. So, so far as it stands, there's about um, 80, 86% um, who have voted uh, to date for C and then 11% voted for D, 2% voted for B and 1% uh, voted for A. So, you know, normally this is something I would love to have kind of a discussion around, but certainly what I would say is, A, when we look at this um, scenario, uh, the majority, again, picking C, would likely have picked for reasons that, A, the assumption they assumed is that it's alcohol and perhaps only alcohol, i.e. it's not roofied or doesn't have any other substance mixed into that. And so um, it may be people pick this because they're familiar with it, it might be because socially it seems accept acceptable in the context that, um, you know, it's the norm or perhaps accepted uh, amongst their peers. Um, they might be able to know and predict um, what kind of response their body would have to that based on their past experiences. Or it might be that just the feeling they get from the alcohol um, that, they, that they enjoy or that they like. And then when we look at D, um, uh, there was about 11%, as I said, who had picked this category. Similarly to alcohol, and certainly since the legalization uh, in recent times, uh, many people uh, often think about cannabis as a little bit more benign, perhaps, compared to some of the other substances. Um, some people say they don't get a hangover or withdrawal um, compared to some of the other substances or uh, even alcohol. Uh, some people say, oh, well, it's got medicinal uh, pur uh, purposes, so that's why I would engage in that. Um, so there could be a multitude. And again, and that's assuming that it's cannabis. And then when we look at B, we had about 2% who picked here. And B, when you look at B, um, you probably might not know exactly what substance that is. And um, again, for the most part, uh, it could be uh, multiple things, um, but certainly many of our stimulants, so i.e., uh, cocaine uh, could be crushed into the powder formulation and here you see someone snorting uh, with a bill and so um, only about a two percent and it might be that um, perhaps they've had one or two experiences with this uh, perhaps they feel they want to feel that high euphoria um, cocaine again when we think comparatively to other substances certainly has a higher cost to it um, so again some of our prof professionals are the one that present using cocaine well um, perhaps some of the lower socioeconomic status um, individuals present with us using um, uh, crystal meth or methamphetamines 
And then when we look at A, um, again, this could be uh, a powdered uh, formulation like cocaine, but you do see pills in the background. And so here, um, certainly we think of the context of something um, like a opioid, um, whether it's oxy or fentanyl. Um, these are things that are uh, diverted and used and often mixed with um, liquid substances, usually acidic like vinegar, and then uh, injected. And so, um, again, each of you might hold your own um, preconceived notions based on your experiences and your cultures, which made you decide which one we're going to do tonight. Now, if I'm going to ask you a second question, if I were to ask you, and you have to be very, very honest, and I see that uh, 97 people responded, um, which of these have you used in the past? And I'd like you again to pull up your poll and vote and tell me uh, which one's uh, you have used or tried in the past. Again, with the assumption now that it's a little bit clear that A is fentanyl, an opioid, B is cocaine, C is alcohol, and D is cannabis. And remember, you guys have the beauty of this being anonymous. Could you imagine if we're in a room together and you're having to disclose or share what you might feel? So let's see how people... So just as I'm kind of looking at the polls right now, um, as we're not quite at the number that we were uh, on the previous question yet, but I'm already noticing that about 99% of people um, have tried C, uh, so alcohol. About 56% have tried D, uh, cannabis. 10% have tried uh, cocaine. And 1% uh, has tried uh, fentanyl. And so when you think about that, uh, you know, one thing that all of us have in common is that we're all U of M alumni. <laughs> so we have at least one um, post-secondary education degree. Um, you know, perhaps there are other things that we share in common in terms of uh, family uh, presence or non-presence dynamics. There could be other factors. Certainly, we'd have to explore that. But if you could take for a moment um, kind of that understanding about uh, what we have tried in this context, and how would you feel in terms of your own um, your own judgment, so the self-stigma that you experience by just having to disclose this, and would that be different if we were face-to-face -face, um, where you might feel judged that, you know, colleague A, B, C, or D might now judge me based on um, uh, what I disclose. And so if you extrapolate that into the context of someone going to see their physician or going into the emergency department or going into a clinic, can you imagine um, the other elements that they'll actually feel and what a challenge it is for them to come forward and actually disclose of their issue? So these are big, big barriers um, that do exist. And if we don't acknowledge that, unfortunately, um, uh, we, won't, uh, we won't get very far. And, you know, I always say, um, all of us are consumers of substances, uh, whether, uh, you know, if you look very closely here on this, uh, this slide, you'll see that whether it's pop or coffee, there's a large portion of us that actually consume these on a daily basis and might not uh, view that as a substance. But again, that is a substance. And uh, tobacco, again, as well, is something that is quite um, uh, prevalent. And as you saw, some of the data has actually gone up despite some of our, um, you know, uh, anti-smoking education campaigns that are out there. So really important that we have a bit of compassion in, in our approach uh, to substance use as disorders. And again, this really attests to, um, you know, people's uh, realities that they face in terms of how they're going to engage with our healthcare, how they will engage in treatment, their access to treatment, um, uh, 
Uh, I have had, for example, uh, patients who are on opiate replacement therapy and then say that, you know, um, you know, my father or my wife wants me to get off of this, uh, you know, dethadone instead of methadone. And so um, these are pressures that people will face and unfortunately um, isn't helpful in the evidence based uh, context. And so while many of you are uh, perhaps retired or uh, working in an environment, wherever that may be, uh, remember that on a daily basis, there's something that we can all do. And um, that's by offering, you know, the, the respect and compassionate support, having open dialogue uh, with individuals, leaving the door open, letting people know that we care and being uh, cognizant of the languages that we use. And so here I've just compiled a bit of a list of things that, um, uh, might seem small on the surface, but can actually go quite a long way. And so, um, you know, uh, offering that compassion support, being aware of our biases, kind of as the example I just took you through, um, you know, see individuals who are affected by substances as worthy of medical care and ensure that they feel that, you know, how would someone entering with a heart attack be treated and viewed comparatively to someone who's entering with an opiate use disorder, as an example? Listen without... Um, while withholding uh, judgment, you know, and not being quick to, to jump in and impose our ideas. Educate yourself. And I'm glad to see that that's uh, certainly why we're all here today. Um, avoid hurtful labels. Uh, just like we went through with diabetes, we no longer use the word diabetic. We say a person with diabetes. Um, certainly when it comes to substances, they are not an addict. It's someone who uses substances. Um, dispel myths. So if people are around you um, and they're perpetuating uh, perhaps some of the stigma, make sure that we break that down with objective and caring uh, data. Use the appropriate languages. Replace some of those negative attitudes again with some of these evidence. And I'll help walk through some of the evidence uh, very shortly here. And, you know, speak up if you see someone mistreated or help advocate for them. Uh, meet the individual where they're at. And so that's something with addictions that's very important because, A, they are very vulnerable and uh, the lives can be very chaotic um, at various points. And so um, helping them uh, for what they need as opposed to just what we want is something that's very important. And offering that spectrum of care, including harm reduction and Harm reduction in the addictions world carries alone a lot of stigma with that too, right? There's this dichotomous view of um, uh, abstinence versus harm reduction. And again, I would challenge people uh, to move beyond just a one versus the other and that we really have to offer a spectrum of care um, that is supported by evidence um, for each of the individuals and ensure that they're getting uh, what they need. And asking early intervention and treatment. And this is something, as I said, that um, is really important and often uh, goes and uh, missed. I'm, um, I sit as an examiner involved in examinations um, all the way up to board certifying exams. And certainly I see within a lot of the training, we're asked very uh, basic when it comes to addictions. And so uh, that's something that I've been helping to um, encourage and foster in uh, certainly in the healthcare system uh, to happen uh, much quicker. And so when we think about um, addictions, uh, again, addictions as a kind of global term carries with it many varying types of uh, definitions. And each of us probably have our, our own uh, perceived notion. And so um, you might hear of things like cravings, um, compulsive use, despite um, uh, negative consequences. Uh, and again, addictions applies with both behavioral and substances, but really focusing on the substances here, there have been a lot of movement to help um, people to see and understand addictions beyond just a notion of uh, moral or, or, or philosophical choice that people engage in, but rather a chronic uh, disease like other chronic diseases. And so to help understand that, I kind of like to show some of the evidence that we are learning. Um, and certainly when we think about in the biological context, um, what you'll see on this image here is that um, I've included for any of the arts uh, individuals on uh, on this session. This is the Rembrandt uh, depiction of the anatomy lesson from Dr. Talp back in 1632. And, uh, you know, I, I like this or I've compiled this image or images for multiple reasons. One, it highlights the art and science of medicine, which is something that um, you need to really have as a strength when you practice in addictions medicine, but also for the fact that 
um, addictions like other areas of medicine, i.e. cardiology, respirology, have been existent for a long time, but we don't have the evidence to understand um, uh, as well when it comes to the brain comparatively to other organs that might be a little bit more straightforward. And so what you see um, on the right hand of the screen are actually some um, uh, MRIs of uh, brain uh, capacity, so nuclear medicine, brain activity um, based on substances. And so if you notice, you have a control next to the addicted brain and four categories of substances there, cocaine, meth, alcohol, and heroin. What you will note is that all of them have had changes in what we call uh, dopamine uptake and particularly in the reward pathway. And what happens is, is when we use substances over time, certainly any kind of substance, um, so say you know, we were going out, we were having our, whether it was the alcohol, the cannabis, or our um, uh, cocaine or fentanyl, that does stimulate a dopamine release, which gives us that kind of euphoric and pleasure sensation. And so, um, obviously, we like to feel good as humans, so we will engage in things that increase that dopamine. Other natural things that increase dopamine are, you know, exercise, um, as long, along with the, the other endorphins, um, you know, hugs, uh, caring, loving uh, uh, expressions to loved ones, uh, food can give us pleasure. And all of the substances that are listed here, cocaine, meth, and alcohol, all stimulate dopamine at different degrees and rates. And what happens is, is over time, when someone uses um, a same substance, it begins to dysregulate that reward pathway. And then what happens is they don't experience the pleasures of the normal day because of that reward pathway in kind of overdrive. And they, in fact, never feel that high that they originally felt with that substance um, that they did that first time. So what happens is they're in a perpetual trying to seek that high but never get that. And worse off now, now they have a physical dependence to a substance that they're actually trying to prevent from going into withdrawal. And so I think this is really important because more and more in recent years, we're starting to begin to really learn and understand what are some of these impacts on the brain, uh, let alone in kind of the rest of the domain. So that's kind of some of the biological that's uh, going on that's consistent with multiple substances. Keep in mind, each substance acts on a different part um, of a receptor or a part of the organ of uh, the body. And we will go through a little bit um, to, to learn about that. And so, again, um, if you look to uh, many of our uh, regulatory bodies in addiction, so whether it's the International Society of Addictions Medicine, the American or the Canadian, and when we look at the healthcare system, we're really redefining addictions as a cr chronic relapsing condition. And again, when you look here on this slide, what you'll see is that um, the variability in terms of relapses, so you could call that relapse masturbation, uh, pending uh, what type of disorder, um, you know, uh, substance use addiction is very similar to many of the other chronic diseases. So for example, asthma, someone has an asthma exacerbation, their uh, relapse rates are around 50 to 70 percent. Um, uh, with type 1 diabetes, we see about 30 to 50 percent. And so when you think about that, if that individual has um, done well for a period and then has a relapse, um, you know, what are we doing and how are we dealing with that? And what is our approach as opposed to just kind of frowning upon them that they're a failure, um, which they might not uh, get with another chronic disease. And so helping to reframe that for people. So understanding biologically, I think this is um, a really important study that came out um, and it was originally conducted in 95 to 97. It's a longitudinal study um, and it's called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And it's a really significant one for chronic uh, diseases, including uh, mental health and addictions. And what they looked at was um, uh, about 14,000 individuals over a period of time um, to see what were some of the impacts in terms of trauma in their childhood and um, their impact of uh, or their resulting um, uh, chronic disease later in life. And so what they did was um, they measured 10 uh, types of trauma in childhood. And so that could include anything from physical, um, emotional, sexual uh, neglect um, to a less perhaps direct personal, but maybe a family unit where they witnessed um, their mother being, you know, physically abused by their father, or there was one of the adults, maybe a mother sent to jail and so incarcerated for uh, a period of their time. 
Um, and what they found was that um, this, these factors were indicators of someone's um, uh, prediction of having a uh, chronic disease in their adult uh, life. And that could include anything from cardiovascular to mental health and addictions. And in fact, the number being four or higher, if you had four or more of these um, uh, indicators, that it would in fact be a serious uh, consequence in terms of uh, chronic diseases. And so, again, when we think about um, upstream movement and when we think about addressing uh, addictions, because it is a very complex area, we need to look kind of upfront, what are we doing to help reduce some of these to then um, increase uh, chances of better success for individuals um, in their adult life. And so um, all of this is uh, certainly part of uh, what we call a very complex bio, psycho, social, neuro, um, environmental uh, uh, illness in that um, addictions has ramifications in all of these. And, you know, if it was as simple as uh, one solution, guaranteed we would have already found that solution. But I think um, as we're facing uh, issues with substances today, we really need to keep all of this in mind and ensure that we're working within um, the areas, uh, as I had just kind of mentioned, um, and also working together to help address these in a more effective way. So what I'd like to do at this point is kind of go through some of the categories of substances um, to help us understand a little bit the climate that we're experiencing in terms of uh, the depth of impacts uh, from substances uh, on uh, Canadians and Manitobans in particular. And so, um, again, not knowing uh, each of your backgrounds and what they might be, um, forgive me if I'm giving too much or too little information, but what you will see here is a list of different opioids. And so um, uh, this has been uh, something that you would may or may have used in um, perhaps an acute pain uh, scenario. Uh, unfortunately, um, sometimes people uh, are on these for chronic pain um, over a period of time and then uh, might develop uh, an addiction uh, to opioids. So uh, certainly including things like hydromorph, morphine, Tylenol 3s, Percocets, fentanyl, um, the list goes on. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of those, and so uh, in in Canada, on any given year, there are about uh, one in five who are actually on an opioid prescription. Um, so just to kind of uh, appreciate that context. So when we think of opioids, opioids have actually been around for quite a long time. So what I've drawn out for you here is a kind of timeline. And um, this is based on information that uh, I could find. So, you know, dating back from 3000 to 4000 BC, there's documentation of the uh, opium poppy, which was discovered and certainly declared as, you know, the, uh, the, happy, uh, the, the happy plant, the joy plant. And people quickly recognized that it had effects that made them feel that euphoria or that kind of happiness. But what they also learned was that um, it also caused problems. So not only the risks of uh, certainly overdose, but, um, you know, sedation, constipation, um, addiction and, and whatnot. And so um, what we saw as time moved forward, and if you look um, on the timeline to the mid uh, 1800s, there actually was the value that um, led to trade commodities uh, worldwide, in particular UK and China, um, where trading tea for poppies was, and there's actually some really good uh, documentaries out there if you wanna look that up. Um, uh, but certainly it became quite a valuable uh, uh, commodity. And it was more so in Canada, more in the 1900s where we saw uh, more of its popularity and, it began more so in the U.S. and on the coasts where um, heroin uh, was used uh, for, for pleasure um, and uh, by uh, many individuals. And it wasn't until the 1990s with the production of Oxycontin by the pharmaceutical company Purdue, who um, had uh, targeted uh, Oxycontin as a pain medication um, uh, without uh, disclosing the risks for uh, addiction associated with that. And so that was used in uh, the context of uh, pain management and unfortunately um, led to what on the street people termed as the hillbilly heroin and meaning that it was cheap, you didn't have to pay for it, came under prescription. And so in Canada um, in the 1990s, we saw uh, an epidemic of Oxycontin. And what 
Purdue did at that point was it reformulated its OxyContin into a a more encapsulated uh, uh, pill form. And what that allowed for was it wasn't easily as crush crushable. And so um, it wasn't uh, as easily snorted. And in fact, they termed it the jelly nose. Um, if you tried to uh, 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 snort that new that new formulation. And so um, what happened was people started moving to morphine, hydromorph and Percocet as a uh, a uh, source um, for their their opioids and then in recent years what you've probably seen a lot on the news is around the uh, fentanyl and carfentanyl and just to note initially when fentanyl was first noted to be abused it was um, the patches that uh, uh, were diverted most often from uh, palliative care uh, and people would scrape off the patches and um, uh, they would mix that with perhaps vinegar and inject it, or they would take the scraps of those patches, keep it in on the side of their mouth, and then it would get buccal buccal release, and um, they called that chiclets. And then what you see there on the bottom is actually a uh, example of a seizure uh, from here in Manitoba with the skull, um, uh, which has uh, uh, different. Uh, formulations inside of fentanyl or carfentanyl. And when you think about some of the potency here, so uh, fentanyl is the um, essentially the highest toxicity of an uh, opioid uh, approved for human use. And that's about 100 times more potent than morphine. And what we know is carfentanyl is 100 times more potent than fentanyl and not safe for human consumption, um, only uh, reserved for uh, large veterinary uh, medicines such as elephants and polar bears. And even there, um, because of the extinctions, vets will tell you they're very afraid to use uh, carfentanyl in that context. And so much of what we see there is um, illicit use and uh, fabrication uh Kind of what we term in the uh, backyard uh, garages and we're seeing a lot of that being um, uh, transported in from China. So that's a little bit kind of the history and what does that mean for us in Canada? Um, you know do we have a large uh, problem or not? Well in fact in terms of uh, consumption per capita we are second um, and that's second only to the U.S. Uh, worldwide. And, and that's very significant given we're only about the, you know, 48th most populous uh, country. And so we do have a bit of uh, disproportion there. And again, you know, um, certainly we have the influences of big pharma, but we also have many other social and cultural impacts, i.e. our uh, perception of pain. Um, again, when we look at Canada, many people have, um, unfortunately, the view that uh, anywhere from, if you look at the literature, about 20 to 30 percent of Canadians believe that they have chronic pain, which is, again, higher than what we see in the rest of the world. And, um, you know, I've had the privilege of having international medical graduates come and train with me. And um, it's interesting to see the culture that, you know, we need a quick fix. We don't want to feel anything negative. We don't want to have experience any pain. Um, these are some of also the factors that come into play. And so, Again, while we, it might be easy to target um, only one area, all of these factors come into play for part of the reasons as to why um, we're, we're facing the epidemics that we are. And so in the recent years, um, what we have been seeing, and I'm going to walk you through from 2016 to 2019, um, you'll see in kind of the quotation bubbles are the two th 2016 data um, of uh, opioid related fatalities um, that were documented across Canada. And so you see um, uh, there were 69 in Manitoba. And then in 2017, that increased to 122. And so when you look kind of across the nation, you'll see that same trend that, you know, numbers went up from 2016 to 17. And what you don't see is that um, in 2016, about 50% of those deaths were actually attributed to fentanyl in particular. And in 2017, that number increased to about 72%. And that was, again, uniformly across Canada. Now, I want you to pay close attention. So when you look in Manitoba, it went from 69 to 122. When we move forward to 2018, what you see is it went down to 62. Now, you might go, what happened here, right? And if we go back even further um, uh, to 2019, which I'll show you in one minute, um, you'll see the number goes down even further to 26, which is actually 
a positive mark. But one of the things importantly that came out in that time was our, our campaign and movement to have wider distribution of naloxone. So when I first started medicine and keep in context, I've been in practice for 10 years. Um, the only time I could administer naloxone is if I myself had prescribed someone who was in hospital um, opioids and they overdosed, I would administer uh, naloxone uh, to reverse uh, that, that overdose effect. Um, or if someone had come in and they had overdosed in the emergency department, I could administer the naloxone. What we're seeing now is more widespread. And again, there's a lot of advocacy to make this easier and more accessible. Um, but certainly within our, um, I believe it's about 76 uh, public health sites across Manitoba, we do have take home naloxone kits, which are available. And again, as you see, uh, a very life saving measure. And not only through public health, but um, also, for example, in institutions or organizations that work with addictions, like the Addictions Foundation of Manitoba, um, we do uh, distribute and teach people how to use those, um, both the high risk and their uh, family members or loved ones. And so when we think about that harm reduction, this is certainly a life saving measure. And I think you see a lot of that um, uh, in those numbers there uh, in terms of fatality uh, reduction. And so if we look a little bit more into this Manitoba context, um, here I'm sharing with you a graph from uh, some of the epi stats uh, from, from Manitoba. And from 2016 to 17, you see even this uh, quarterly kind of uh, a graph that shows the numbers of fatalities here in Manitoba, and this is from medical examiner data. So again, all of these not being necessarily a full um, a full depiction of the real uh, the real issue, likely an underestimation. Um, but what you do see is that the males are here in gray, and females are the dotted and uh, uh, dotted graphs. And we do see that trend again of uh, opioids increasing. And again, in 2017, so we'll be looking forward to Manitoba's um, most recent data to share and update us to see uh, those uh, numbers reflecting coming down. And then when we look at hospitalizations, because fatalities are not the only measure, um, but certainly when we see fatality or uh, hospitalizations, here we see a bit of the reverse where there are more females who are hospitalized for opioid related uh, uh, poisonings and males a little bit less. Um, but again, that trend um, from 2009 up to 2017 uh, moving upward. This is a graph uh, showing us by region. So um, uh, certainly when we look at the hospitalizations within our uh, sectors of health, so the Winnipeg, the Interlake, the Northern, the Southern, and Prairie Mountain, um, what you will see is that the Winnipeg uh, Regional uh, Health Authority has the highest numbers, uh, followed by Prairie Mountain, then uh, Interlake, then Northern, and then Southern. Now keep in mind, this is only by hospitalization. And again, when we look at this, what was the, the data that informed this was this, um, the number one issue that was written down or documented um, or uh, was it not? And so this could be uh, underestimations. And again, who's going to get the help that they need when we think about that stigma? So really important, again, to keep that in context. Importantly, uh, people who had overdosed um, from an opioid, here's the data of other substances that were on board. And that's really important because many people who do use substances um, often uh, combine, which then uh, leads to higher risk in terms of uh, lethality, um, uh, often by uh, shutting down the respiratory system and uh, unfortunately stopping their breathing and uh, uh, possibly death thereafter. And so when we look at these and you look at this, so many of these might be over the counter substances. So, um, you know, whether it was a nasal decongestant um, uh, that they might have used, it could be um, uh, perhaps a prescribed medication like an antipsychotic or, you know, an antidepressant, some of the antihistamines again over the counter, could be other substances they've engaged in like alcohol, methamphetamine, coke, could be another prescribed uh, pain medication like gabapentin, um, which is also abused um, in a lot of our Manitoba population. And so when you see this, you see percentages 
of um, that concomitant use. And I really wanna draw your attention to the benzodiazepines because um, that's virtually in about half of those individuals using opioids. And so we know that um, many people who use opioids often uh, also use benzodiazepines, but benzodiazepines are also a problematic substance that um, uh, not a lot of people talk about. And in fact, when I work in, uh, in clinic, often people will not want to or are not prepared to disclose about their benzodiazepine use. And again, some of the stigma around that and how that has been marketed, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So just keep that in mind. So as I was explaining about um, the reversal or the antidote medication, naloxone, um, what you see here is the kind of chemical representation of uh, what naloxone does at the receptor level. And what you see here is that naloxone actually has a really high affinity for uh, the mu opioid receptors uh, in our brain. And so it will displace other opioids. So i.e. if I've been using morphine, naloxone comes along, it will bump off the morphine and sit on that receptor and actually reverse um, uh, that respiratory depression that I'm going under. And so again, this is a life-saving measure, but you know, it works within uh, a couple minutes and its duration is at max up to about 90 minutes. So this does not sustain forever. And again, people have multiple substances. So we do really encourage that people uh, access help right away, call 911 um, uh, and ensure that we're getting the individuals that the care that they need, particularly when you think about, you know, if it's morphine or uh, hydromorph or oxy, their uh, half-life is much longer for those medications comparatively to naloxone. So that's a short-term measure for uh, reversal uh, impacts. But importantly, when it comes to opioids, and uh, an important reason for me, one of my bread and butter uh, everyday um, uh, functions is working in uh, the world of uh, opiate agonist treatment. And so um, fortunately, compared to other substances, we do have a very effective uh, medication uh, options that are available to us. And I had the privilege um, to work on our Canadian uh, guidelines for um, opiate use disorder, which was funded by Kai Hai and CRISM. So uh, CRISM is the Canadian Research Initiative Substance Misuse, which is a branch um, of the Canadian Institute for Health Information. And so um, again, uh, looking at the data that existed elsewhere, um, we developed our, our national guidelines, which certainly outlines um, uh, what is the safe practice and evidence-based approach um, for an opiate use disorder. And um, what is uh, significant with our Canadian, perhaps compared to some of the other international, is that we note that the buprenorphine naloxone, or otherwise known as Suboxone, um, as the number one, again, because of um, its safety profile. So buprenorphine is a partial agonist as opposed to a full agonist. And if you think back to that slide where I showed you the receptors, um, you know, all of the morphine, hydromorph, fentanyl, those are all full opioids that sit onto the receptor. Um, buprenorphine is a partial, so it sits a little bit differently. So it doesn't have that same profile of side effects, but it's also a very strong affinity. And so again, the risk for respiratory depression is substantially lower than um, any other opioid, um, plus side effects uh, or um, interactions with other medications are um, uh, much more reduced. And so this is a, a good safe option that uh, we recommend as number one. Number two would be methadone, and then number three, slow uh, release or a morphine. And another significant um, in our recommendations are certainly not to just go with an abstinent only approach. And so again, as I mentioned earlier about abstinence and harm reduction, um, sometimes people hold uh, philosophical opinions around that, but we know and data shows that um, you know, relapse rates, and if you can think about that graph where I showed for addictions, um, you know, floating in that kind of 40 to 60 percent, when it comes to opioids, relapse rate are as high as 90 and over in virtually all the data. And so, um, again, we don't want to set people up for failure, but importantly, if they, if they only uh, go abstinent, they go abstinent right away like this, and they're at risk of uh, relapsing, reusing, all it takes is three days of no use of opioids before you lose your tolerance. And if you were to use the same amount of opioid you had previously, you could overdose and potentially die. And so really important that we're 
we're doing things in a safe context with people um, uh, in terms of what fits for them. And we're offering a, um, a multitude of options that fit, with, fit well with them in that safe manner. And so, again, when we think about the harm reduction approach along with that, um, that we're including things like take home naloxone kits, uh, supervised consumption sites, clean needles and other supplies to help reduce those associated harms. So in terms of best practice, we know that opiate agonist treatment um, is certainly there. I will say that we do have novel treatments that are now available as of um, uh, 2020. So we've got the um, implantable buprenorphine, which is also known as probufen, and um, that's implantable rods that sits uh, within the arms. Again, these are all specialized um, techniques that do require um, physicians to have added training for these. And then the sublocade, which is an injectable uh, format of the buprenorphine um, as well. And so um, these are things that will become more accessible and again, help because when people are on opiate agonist treatment in oral form, so i.e. the suboxone or methadone, they in fact have to go for daily dispensing um, uh, due to safety reasons at the pharmacy. And so it's quite an intensive program uh, for individuals. And so uh, this will allow for a lot of uh, uh, accommodating lifestyle for them. And then again, when we think about um, moving towards coming off their medication, that this uh, be a supported uh, long-term taper and always have uh, you know, the availability of uh, naloxone around in case things uh, don't go well. So that's kind of a little summary of opioids. And then when we think about stimulants, so here are things that might come to mind are, you know, certainly prescriptions like Conserva, Ritalin, um, you know, on the street, cocaine, crack, uh, crystal meth. Um, again, these have all been available uh, for a long period of time. And actually, historically, um, we have amphetamines and methamphetamines that have stemmed back from, you know, world wars where, um, you know, uh, Hitler had been using some of these with his with his army. And so certainly there there's documentation of things like this. And when we think about what stimulants do, that uh, helps to bring our central nervous system uh, really up and alive and, and going. And so, um, in fact, people do use these for specific reasons. Um, and uh, some people also really like that strong euphoria associated with that. Unfortunately, in Manitoba, what that is translating to today is um, what we're calling the methamphetamine uh, epidemic. And unfortunately, that's carrying with it other consequences, which we're just going to review. So what I will say, the methamphetamine that we're seeing on the street today is not the same methamphetamine that we had 10 years ago when we had that other little blurb for um, kind of increase or surge of that use. And um, uh, unfortunately, the methamphetamine's potency is quite high and lending that there's a lot of um, other consequences such as psychosis, um, uh, you know, uh, organ failure, um, aggressivity, uh, paranoia um, that are accompanying these presentations. And um, we'll see here in the next few slides um, how that's translating some of these impacts. So. What you'll see uh, here is an infograph that the Addiction Foundation of Manitoba pulled together with some of our uh, provincial data. And what you'll see is that the number of reported use in youth went up by 48% and in adults 104%. Um, so that is substantial and that's between 2014 and 17. In terms of gender and age, both adult and youth, we see a higher percentage amongst females. And when I said that people use for reason, when you think about that, if you know, if you're on the street and you're homeless and, you know, you might be beaten, you might be raped, you might have uh, your things stolen, uh, you might want to have something that's going to keep you awake, alert and ready for that fight or flight. And certainly methamphetamine provides that. Plus, it's um, dirt cheap. So um, comparatively to other substance, it's very accessible um, uh, on the street today. And so um, that can be a contributing reason. We know in stimulants generally, females tend to use more stimulants, could be things related to uh, weight control or management and other uh, important factors like that uh, that come into play. And then when you look on that bottom graph, um, what you'll see are actually deaths related um, uh, to amphetamines. And you see that increasing trend in 2016 and 17. And then finally, you'll see the map of Cam or map of Manitoba, and um, these are the ER visits uh, that have um, increased uh, subsequent to the methamphetamine alone, and uh, substantially 1,700% increase in Winnipeg. So um, very, very impactful. 
Now, uh, this is our chief, Danny Smythe. And um, again, within the police, service, police services, they're recognizing the depth of the problem of methamphetamine and substances and recognizing that, you know, the approach of uh, legal issues is not the only way uh, to do that. And really, um, they need to get uh, connected with the health. And so um, I've had the fortune of working uh, with the police services over the past few years uh, in my context of leadership on looking at how we might um, get people connected better into care. But just to note here, you know, as he said, 19% uh, increase in property crime, uh, police calls um, have increased uh, by 5% to 618,321 uh, calls over the past year. And most of them are seeking assistance of well being um, and often and importantly, uh, meth being the uh, uh, underlying cause associated with that. So as you see, um, that impact trickling down into other domains of our, our social care. And when we think about meth, um, as I explained, some of the factors, you know, um, certainly it's a, a more potent, but it's also longer acting comparatively uh, to cocaine or crack. And so um, that's uh, another benefit why someone might want to uh, consume methamphetamine. As I said, the cost now, also, when we look at um, uh, its forms of how it could be used, it's water soluble. And that's a very important factor, because as opposed to having uh, like crack, you might have to melt, uh, melt things down. This is easily you can just and why we call that shakers. You take the, uh, the meth, you shake it in water, and then you can inject it directly. And so um, very easily uh, uh, used on the street, which has uh, convenience from that perspective, but also has um, uh, significant outcomes, which you'll see here. And one of a main contributor reason to uh, many of these factors. So one, we're seeing a lot more um, infections and that could be um, from cellulitis and septic joints. So for people who are not familiar in the healthcare domain, it's essentially infections that either live in the skin, the joints, um, in our blood, um, which is quite serious and can lend uh, again to fatalities, and then can seed on the valves of our, our heart and in fact impede on the ability for the valves of the heart to pump the blood through effectively. And again, these are quite significant consequences and require hospitalizations um, and uh, sometimes valve replacements, uh, which normally we wouldn't see in particularly with infective endocarditis. I can think of a patient that I have who's 30 years old now and has had two valve replacements um, already by the, by the age of 30 uh, due to infective endocarditis by injecting. And so that's really, really important. We're also seeing the rates of hep C and HIV. Um, if you look on the blue graph on the bottom, 2016, you see the numbers of HIV there. Hep C, just of note, we know um, it can also transmit uh, through the nasal mucosa. So if people are snorting using and sharing snorting paraphernalia, not just injecting, um, uh, the virus can live on the nasal mucosa and uh, uh, certainly transmit. So really important that we're using a harm reduction approach about not sharing, you know, bumping off uh, our hands, cut up the straws. These are important tips that we can give patients to help prevent some of these outcomes. And then uh, really importantly, uh, what we're seeing is rates of syphilis uh, and even congenital syphilis here in Manitoba in 2020, which in the reality of, of the healthcare and the technology we have today really should be non-existent. And yet, as you can see, these rates um, are, are increasing. And so really, really important that if we don't address these underlying issues um, with substance use, uh, we, we will continue to have uh, more and more outcomes uh, that unfortunately don't bode well uh, for, for anyone. And so when we think about methamphetamines and crystal meth and coke and uh, crack, we really don't have an agonist treatment like we do um, with opioids. And that's, that, that, that has its own challenges um, in that respect. So um, meaning we don't have a medication that we can reverse anything and we don't have a medication that we can give them to help stabilize their uh, brain receptors and then, um, you know, help get the rest of uh, their life together, whether it's coping skills, uh, counseling, addressing the underlying trauma. And so really we have to focus a lot on uh, managing um, some of that intensive psychotherapy with these individuals. We need to ensure we're treating all of these um, health associated outcomes. Uh, we are using olanzapine um, as an antipsychotic measure for those presenting in the post 
um, withdrawal stages. So usually in the, the two weeks following to help with some of that mood that declines and some of the psychosis that might be associated with that. But again, that longer term intensive psychotherapy um, is really where um, uh, the bang for the buck is at this point in time um, and support counseling harm reduction and assessing comorbidity for uh, psychiatric issues is also very important um, as of uh, like with every other uh, substances. So now if we look at kind of our category of alcohol in terms of depressants, as I'd mentioned in the earlier portion of the presentation, alcohol is still our number one in terms of impacts for um, all health uh, outcomes and so in that burden uh, that it poses. And, you know, there are many factors when it comes to alcohol. So uh, it is about 20% of Canadians drink above the low risk drinking uh, guidelines. Um, and it's a little bit higher uh, here in Manitoba in some po parts of the population. Uh, the use and risk use of alcohol, interestingly, in underage and young adults appears to be declining a bit, but it's being replaced with the cannabis and we'll We'll learn about that uh, very shortly. But when you think about this, we have more hospitalizations for health, alcohol than we do for um, heart attacks in any given year. And yet, um, when we think about the resources that move forward and the treatment and the protocols. So if I'm working in emergency, I have a very clear process of what happens on how I manage a heart attack. But when it comes to um, someone who's presenting with an alcohol use disorder, either in withdrawal or intoxication, um, often it's we stabilize the acute, whether it's managing the seizure, um, whether it's, you know, pumping their stomach, getting them uh, well stabilized and then sending them off and go into this black box of addictions and somehow get fixed. They might never be offered um, medications or treatment that are available to them. And we'll talk about that again very shortly. And so, again, I think that's to do with our cultural views and some of the stigma that exists. And so um, this is certainly another area where um, uh, I love to uh, advocate and help move forward so that way uh, we ensure we're doing the best that we can for individuals because grossly um, we need to do a, a better job. And so um, here you see youth first report alcohol about age 16. I will tell you that patients that I work with um, uh, most often report, and again, these are people who have uh, heavy substance use disorders who are usually um, getting help by this time, uh, often report as young as uh, age seven to nine. So um, well, the average reported youth in general is 16. Keep in mind, people might not always um, mention or might not disclose that it's younger, but those who do, when they uh, do seek help, it is um, st substantially younger as well. And if you're familiar with Dr. Teresa Tam, you might see some of her commercials uh, on right now for um, certainly the coronavirus. Um, her report uh, that came out in 2018 uh, talked a lot about alcohol and um, the important impacts and even more so on the female population where they saw the death rates increase from about 26% comparatively to men is only increasing about 5%. So that's really significant when we think about that uh, discrepancy in terms of increase. And importantly, uh, in Manitoba, what we see too is that um, for females and First Nations, that percentage drinking above uh, the low risk drinking guidelines is about 30% as opposed to the 20% uh, a nation. And so when you think about reasons that might might be, and when we think about even the methamphetamine uh, with females, what we're seeing is if, you know, there's been a lot more trauma, uh, whether sexual or other um, in their childhood might be a way of coping. Um, you know, I always say with alcohol, it tends to be our cultural view that, hey, I've had a bad day okay, I'm going to pick up a glass of wine or I'm going to pick up that beer. Oh, I've had a good day. Let's celebrate. Let's have that <laughs> that wine or that beer. And so what has been our, our learned responses on those? That's, that's certainly uh, one possibility along with kind of the trauma and other things and also targeting, uh, a media targeting that. And so when we think about this, um, you know, females in terms of uh, you know, I think there's this skinny vodka and, you know, uh, these coolers that are really promoted and targeted to females to drink and to kind of keep up with men in that kind of workforce and uh, kind of that whole image along with that. And so um, I just wanted to share with you some of a me example of a media that's out there and how prevalent it is and how targeted it is. And I think this shows well. So some of you might be uh, familiar with Cougar Town. Now, this is a long video. I'm only going to show part of it. So I'll stop it um, partway through. But let's see if this works here. <laughs> Who 
it's wine. Ooh. Happy weekend! <laughs> you know we drink lots of red wine. Yeah, and? That's it. For you ladies, I assume two giant buckets of wine? Red, please. Half red, half white. Where should I put this wine? In our bodies. More wine? Oh, oh you need more Chardonnay. And better Chardonnay. Can I get another vase of wine? You have any of that pink wine? I was going out to get wine. You stole from me to support a drinking habit, and we could come back and drink that $28 bottle of wine that you bought. It was really two $14 bottles of wine, and uh, they're gone. <laughs> that's why I ordered the expensive wine. Well, that's confusing, because this punishment is delicious. I think I'll have some breakfast wine. You don't even like wine, do you? Yes, I do. I've just never had it right after brushing my teeth. I've had it while brushing my teeth. Travis, get down here and have a glass of wine. So nice to be here with you this weekend and not at your mom's with the purple tooth curl. So, I'm going to stop that there. But you see that that messaging, whether it's morning, whether it's night, whether it's a good day, whether it's a bad day, whether in a loving relationship or whether with your friends or alone, it's really promoted and targeted and is viewed as kind of the acceptable and the in thing to do. And so the impacts of those messaging, as you're seeing, um, particularly in this example um, with females is quite prevalent. And if you think it's just kind of in the, the larger scale, um, what you'll see on this slide is in fact, uh, my mother and my sister and myself uh, had went out to a local Manitoban uh, restaurant. And um, if you see closely on the sign, it says, if you refill a wine glass before it's uh, empty, it still counts as one glass. So you see the messages are really there no matter where you go. And um, again, really important uh, that we note that and we're aware of that. And so when we think about in Manitoba, a lot of, um, just like elsewhere in Canada, a lot of alcohol use disorder is not picked up until uh, later. And so here's some of these statistics showing that um, uh, if we started patching things a little bit earlier, um, we could, and we know when it comes to any substance use disorder, the earlier um, the intervention, the better the outcomes. And so, um, and that's for preventing uh, multiple illnesses. And with alcohol in particular, we think of cancer, we think of um, cirrhosis, we think of pancreatitis, um, the list goes uh, on and on. And so we really need to be uh, focusing our attention on many things, including uh, education around that. So we're going to do um, one poll here. One, this is our kind of last poll. And you've, you've heard me cite about the low risk drinking guidelines. And just kind of to uh, test ourselves, please no one look anything up. I want you to answer honestly. And Tracy, if you want to get the poll ready, again, pull out your, um, uh, uh, your tool here. We're going to have uh, two questions. So the first one is for females, how, how, what is the amount of drinks per week? And then the drinks per day that the lowest drinking guidelines recommend. Is it A, no more than 30 per week and five per day? Is it B, no more than 20 per week and three per day? Or C, 20 per week, two per day? Or D, 10 per week and two per day? So put in your votes. And just instinctively put in what you think. There's nothing is recorded. You're not graded. And we won't take away your degrees if you get this wrong. <laughs> it's really just to gauge where we're at. So I'm seeing about 92% saying D, uh, 10 and 2, about 5% saying 20 and 2, and then 1% of both uh, uh, A and B to date so far. We'll give a few more seconds for people to answer. I see there's less people answering comparatively to the first questions. <laughs> on stigma.
Okay. Maybe we'll we'll stop there and then we're going to move to the second question. So for males, um, how many drinks per week uh, for men with no more than how many per day? So the same premise. So is it 55 and 5? Uh, so 55 per week, 5 per day. 10 per week and 2 per day. 15 per week and 3 per day. Or 25 per week and 4 per day. So put in your answers. So what I'm seeing here so far is about 68% saying C, 15 to 3, 31% saying 10 to 2, and then 1% uh, saying 25 to 4, and 0% saying 55 to 5. So in fact, here are the low-risking dr uh, drinking guidelines. So no more than 10 uh, per week for women and no more than 2 per day. And for males, that's no more than 15 per week and 3 per day. And that you have to plan that not every single day you're drinking, and that's important because for um, habit development. And so if you notice, that's not why we have uh, 14 uh, max for females and, um, you know, uh, uh, for, for males similarly. And so um, really important that the message being you're not drinking every day and that we're really limited to, to those. Now, I notice a lot of people also put the 10 to do, and I love the idea that people are thinking we really want to keep this at a minimum. Again, this is not for people that if you don't drink, don't drink. But if you are drinking, this is really the guideline that helps to ensure that um, we're minimizing risks and harms associated with that. And why it's different between male and female, many people tell me, and again, you guys, I'm just going to salute you guys your percentages and answers are substantially better than many other uh, venues um, when i ask this question and importantly ask people because i think it's important that we're we know um some of the these guidelines that are out there and uh, unfortunately many people are not aware and that's why we see our numbers of 20 to 30 percent drinking above this and also to get kind of people thinking about um some of the uh the harms associated with that but um, many people think that the reason why men can drink more is because they're bigger. So weight for weight, uh, when we look at a male and female, it's not solely the poundage. And I'm going to explain to why to you in the next slide. But before I do that, I just want to share with you a little bit what each drink consists of. So when we say that three or two, so it would be one beer, uh, one cooler, so a five ounce of wine. And keep in mind when you go to a, a restaurant, when I've looked on the menu, it's always six ounce or nine ounce. They don't even serve the five ounce but it's a five ounce that counts as one serving. Um, so if you have that nine ounce, you're, uh, you're vir virtually your two drinks for your, for your females right there. And again, this is not the elderly population. This, this is adult population. And then a 1.5 ounce of any kind of distilled liquor. So that's kind of your gauge in terms of um, uh, sizing of alcohol. But alcohol, as I was saying, is not just on our body size. Certainly body size and tolerance do have um, some factors. But importantly, alcohol is actually a toxin in our body, meaning that our body doesn't like it. Um, so unlike the opioids that um, actually respond to the new opioid receptors, along with the delta and kappas, and we'll, you know, with cannabis, we have the endocannabinoid system. With alcohol, we don't have a system that, um, uh, you know, it's it does something in terms of for us that way it's actually a toxin and so what we do have is an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase and that breaks down the alcohol uh, primarily in the liver um, and uh, what we do know is with males comparatively to females males have more and they have some in their stomach so um, some females might have a bit in their stomach but females substantially less le less so if you were to imagine i were coming to a bar and you know pound for pound i'm next to a guy who's verbatim, same muscle mass, uh, uh, fat mass, uh, so forth, we, we do some shots. Just by doing the shots, as soon as it hits our stomach, 
I'm going to be 30% more drunk than my male counterpart. And that's really important. And as you saw, why we're seeing that 26% increase in harms associated with meals and deaths um, comparatively to males. And so, um, again, when we understand that, we understand reasons and why some of the guidelines have been shifted. And again, not just uh, peer on size. So meaning if someone says, hey, I'm a you know, a big woman or I'm a small man, I can't have whatever there, there's other biological reasons at play. And so when we think about alcohol and best practices, um, as I was mentioning, many people are, are never offered uh, many of the options that are available. And so first line treatment for alcohol use disorder are um, medications like naltrexone and acamprosate. And so they work on things like cravings, they work on some of those uh, post uh, acute withdrawal symptoms such as uh, you know insomnia, dysphoria, um, uh, actual cravings, and they can decrease kind of the binge preference. Um, these are really important. They can be uh, life saving measures. When I work in clinic and someone comes in for this, they often have tried abstinence like you know 10, 15 times. They feel like a failure. Um, maybe the system has told their employer or they themselves. And once we get them started on some medications. Um, and uh, they have su success and respond to that, um, you see their whole life change. And that's really important in terms of uh, longevity and outcomes that way. What you'll see here are some other medications that are used that are not as strong evidence as um, the first two noted. And then what you'll notice is the managed alcohol programs. Those are uh, places where people um, who really have failed on multiple treatments and have a lot of other uh, factors associated um, in their life. And so they might be homeless, they might have lost their job, lost their, uh, you know, uh, their home, their family or on the street. And um, it's a place where people can go get connected. They get um, usually white wine at intervals of every 90 minutes of about six ounces. And it's really helping to manage so they don't go into withdrawal, have seizures, DTs, keeps that stable, avoids that kind of heavy, risky drinking, and importantly, gets them connected with a social group, primary care, all of the other needs that um, are associated with that. Interestingly, um, my CEO and our board chair, uh, we had gone and done a visit in Ontario to Thunder Bay and Kenora, um, and Ottawa also has, but we didn't go to Ottawa, has some of these managed alcohol programs. And um, uh, what I noted when I'd kind of gone around and I was talking to people who are using the service, there was a large proportion of Manitobans that were actually uh, there using those services. So again, attesting to the need that we have. And then again, support, counseling, harm reduction, and Again, if they're going to be abstinent, what are the programs that are there to support them and help them through that um, once it's safe uh, in terms of no DTs or seizures, if that is uh, the case for them. So similarly to alcohol, we have uh, benzodiazepines. And again, here we don't talk enough about these. Uh, many people feel that, you know, they're important medication for my anxiety or my insomnia. Um, really, these are meant for a short term uh, only in that context, but unfortunately, many people uh, remain on them uh, longer term. And the psychological dependence associated with benzodiazepines, I can say anecdotally in clinic, people hold on to them like no tomorrow. Now, we do loop um, Zopocone and what we call the Z drugs in with those. And so when you think about benzodiazepines, you might have heard it's like the PAM family. So lorazepam, clonazepam, alprazolam, diazepam, temazepam, uh, the list goes on. Um, these again are sedating uh, anxiolytics. And so in a short-term context might be appropriate, but again, for long-term it can cause rebound anxiety um, and um, certainly has issues with memory impairment, learning ability and whatnot. And so what you'll see here is that despite some of these risks, Canada um, uh, is at high use. We don't have and we don't collect a lot of the data when it comes to benzodiazepines, but um, I can say that some of the data that we do have in here, um, it talks about within uh, our First Nations community as reported uh, by Health Canada in terms of um, on the kind of uh, our uh, medication coverage system, they saw that um, their plan had jumped up uh, from 2007 to 2012. It jumped up by 15%. So that means, again, a, a substantial amount of that being prescribed. But not only that, the um, uh, the amount or the dose of that medication also went up by 13.3%. So again, that attests to you know, um, that physical dependence and needing more to get kind of that same effect. And then again, in the elderly, quite dangerous, but um, uh, 
uh, roughly about a 19% increase in the population from 65 to 74. So um, again, we're seeing some populations uh, more specifically impacted. Here's a, um, a research article that was done in Alberta, um, essentially saying that uh, they recognize that uh, benzodiazepines and Z drugs are highly, um, the use was high and substantial proportion um, uh, of the use appeared to be potentially inappropriate and that uh, really we need to get more um, education and monitoring in terms of prescribing, uh, prescribing practices and use of these. Uh, recently in 2020, so the works is a supervised consumption site in Toronto, um, but they were finding, you note down there, the floalprazolam, which is actually a, a newer novel benzodiazepine. And so um, uh, this is being contaminated in some of the illicit sources. So benzos mixed with opioids, again, uh, both sedating uh, higher risk of uh, uh, overdose and fatality, add alcohol, another depressant, and there you go. And when we look in the US, here you can see emergency visits, particularly related um, uh, to uh, specific uh, benzodiazepines. So alprazolam counting about 36%. In general, uh, benzodiazepine is about 30%. Uh, Zolopidem, which is kind of like our Zopiclone um, in that family and, and total visits. So again, the impacts are there. Um, we need to talk a little bit more uh, about benzodiazepines and sure we're having uh, conversations and, and uh, following through on evidence-based care with that. And so, you know, when it comes to benzodiazepines in terms of treatment, um, we often do a little bit of a longer taper. Um, you'll see things like the Ashton Manual, which have been uh, developed to help guide uh, practitioners in, in uh, providing that. You really have to have that strong therapeutic relationship with the individual. As I mentioned, um, the psychological dependence is quite high with benzodiazepines. And so um, really that approach with the, uh, the individual and the prescriber are really important for that. So the last substance we're going to talk before I talk about um, uh, a little bit about what we're doing and then uh, we'll close off for the day and have questions is cannabis. And you know, I just want to state, I didn't make any kind of disclosure, but uh, in the beginning, but again, I have no commercial interests. I don't have any, re you know, relationships with any pharmaceuticals and nor do I for cannabis. So I'm just, and I don't have any stock and I don't have any investments in, uh, in anything. So I'm just kind of disclosing that there. And, you know, uh, I would say in today's world, um, you know, whether you're a healthcare provider or a lay person, you really probably feel like this when you start to look at um, what's going on with cannabis. And that's because there, um, a lot of the literature that we do have stems from uh, a long time ago when the product was quite, quite different than what we're seeing in terms of the cannabis today. And, you know, there's a lot of pros and cons and a lot of literature that support, but then negate. And so it's a very confusing time and hard for many people. So we'll, we'll just walk through a little bit about this. So cannabis being um, obviously a, the genus is cannabis. So in terms of our uh, plant family member, um, there's three different species. So the sativa, the indica and the ruderalis, although uh, sativa and indica are the two main that are out, we really don't have pure, pure hybrids um, anymore. They're usually blends. Um, and so uh, these are the, the plants. What you see here is the cannabis plant and the buds and the uh, trichomes. So I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, but residing within here, those have the higher concentration. And although, as you see on the bottom here, uh, the different strains, the plant is what we see and recognize as the cannabis, the actual leaf part has uh, the lesser amount of um, the active ingredients. And so we have, we usually talk about the two primary active ingredients, one being the tetrahydrocannabinol or THC. And THC is what is, uh, gives us that psychoactive effect or gives that kind of high feeling. Um, this is known to have few therapeutic uh, effects comparatively to the CBD. Um, and uh, as you can see here, there's a few other properties when we talk about, there's the chemical structure. And here's the cannabidi cannabidiol or CBD. And there are about 113 cannabinoids um, that are identified within the plant. This really has um, no psychoactive ingredient, actually has the medicinal or more that anti-inflammatory property, um, which has that, that medicinal component. So really important to understand those are the two primary players when it comes to cannabis. And so again, kind of like alcohol, some of the perception is, well, it's, you know, it's, it's benign. No substance that we take has 
is completely benign or malicious. There's always um, uh, multiple factors that come into play. So for those of you who might have smoked uh, cannabis back in the day, so uh, as you see here, it dates from kind of the 1960s all the way up, what you'll notice is the trend. The trend in THC, so back in the 70s, most of it sat around, you know, 0.5 to 2.5% THC in terms of content. We're now looking at usually percentages anywhere from 15 to 90, most of them in the 30 amount. So that's a substantial difference in terms of psychoactive properties comparatively um, to 0.5 or 2%. So, you know, if you were to go out and engage in cannabis compared to back in that day, you might have a, a complete different experience. And I'm not going to belabor a lot in uh, a lot in these graphs, but I will tell you that whether it's um, and if you look here carefully, whether it was you know authorities that seized uh, products or um, what people have reported as using, um, what you will notice is that um, that THC trend uh, has been increasing throughout the years, as is on all these other graphs. So whether it was emergency uh, department visits, whether it was uh, direct seizures again from authorities um, or people accessing care that trend has been uh, consistent US and Canada. Not only is the content, but how things are consumed. So whether someone's inhaling, they're orally consuming it or uh, sublingually or other, that affects the rate of absor absorption. It affects the duration, um, uh, the duration of the effect and the onset of that effect. And so um, really important that we're thinking about, uh, you know, not driving, um, and again, uh, you know, the legal authorities in terms of driving are, are clamping down and stuff like that, but we really think about um, those impacts. Some of the impacts on the brain, again, uh, when we look, uh, you know, that it's known for increased appetite, the euphoria, relaxation, and, um, it can have some uh, dual effects and depends on kind of dose, but um, and strain in terms of uh, anxiety and paranoia, um, altered senses and some uh, disordered thinking, impaired learning and decreased motor control. And again, why those are important is um, uh, particularly with youth, it can affect and where the medical community has really recommended that below the age of 25, uh, not consuming cannabis, um, importantly, because we have not of our uh, not all of the brain development occurring at that point. And so um, we know that, um, as I was saying, with the dose dependence of uh, of the THC, the stronger you use, um, the earlier you use and the longer you use um, has impacts on brain development uh, along with others. And so that's really important. And just kind of help illustrate sometimes that uh, kind of ability, what you see here is that kind of path to craving. So a lot of people will tell me, you know, I really need it. I'm craving it. I, I need this to feel good. So kind of like a, um, a map direction. And you see that here when, if you put in on your Google maps, it'll by default show, show you the quickest route or the ones that you've done the most repetitively. And our brains are very similar. Once we've done that kind of pattern, it becomes kind of the default. And so, uh, quickly people will, um, you know, want to have and kind of feel the need for that cannabis. So, you know, the addiction rate is about 10%. But if you use earlier on in your youth, that percentage goes higher. And if you use a higher THC content, that uh, that uh, risk goes up. So when it comes to cannabis, there's the challenges of what it, what is in that specific product? What is the labeling? What is the control? How much of all of these percentages are in there? Um, how is the form consumed? There's a lot of variables, so not an easy solution about what that means. Um, we have individuals presenting with cannabis intoxication, both cardiovascular and neurologically. So that can mean seizures. It can mean uh, cardiac arrest. And so we've seen we've seen this a lot more with youth uh, and presentations uh, in our emergency departments in Canada. Uh, that going up, you can have withdrawal syndrome um, from cannabis. And so um, uh, certainly we prescribe synthetic um, to help uh, prevent uh, some of those withdrawals, withdrawals when people are tapering off. You can get specific symptoms. Syndromes. For males, you can get something called gynecomastia, so that's kind of male breasts. You can get hyperemesis cannabinoid syndrome, which is essentially a, a non-protractable kind of uh, cyclic vomiting that really doesn't respond to anything uh, in terms of typical medications. Uh, one of the pathognomic features is that uh, a hot shower um, uh, really helps. And when we think about the endocannabinoid system in our body, it helps with thermal regulation and um, kind of some of those euphoric. And so that hot shower helps to alleviate that kind of component. And so uh, really the only treatment there is uh, weaning them off. And um, as I said, with the eMERGE visit, those are realities that we are seeing. 
And so when we talk about best practice, I didn't do a poll on this one, but some of the key things are really ensuring that we have lower amounts of THC and higher CBD. If you're going to choose uh, consuming this, um, uh, you know, don't consume along with other substances. So don't be drinking, using opioid, using benzos. Again, the impacts, we prefer the non-smoking as smoking. Anything is uh, not good for our lungs um, and really refraining um, under the age of 25. And you'll see there's um, other 10 suggestions. Again, things like don't drive uh, for the periods after. So where does that leave um, kind of hearing some of all of this in terms of, of substances? Um, you know, where does that leave us in general? So first of all, just in the context of coronavirus, and I can't help but bring this up given um, our, our current status, but um, uh, what we are seeing is a change in access. So as areas or communities are being shut off from, for example, certain dealers because they can't uh, you know, mobilized to community A, B, C, or, um, you know, as, as certain substances are moving in from province to province, we now have shut down uh, of those during the coronavirus. Um, it might be their access to alcohol based on this. It might be some of their personal experiences, whether they've had a job loss, they're stuck at home, um, some of their mental health and other issues uh, might be impacting how uh, they consume substances all of those are quite important in terms of uh, the impacts on uh, what we're seeing. You know, the convenience of being home, I don't have to drive anywhere. Um, uh, I can just drink, uh, you know, and it's easier to drink. I don't have the shame of people watching me. Um, again, these are all impacts that we're seeing. And then uh, certainly domestic abuse has been climbing during this context. And then what happens with our homeless? So one of the things we've been trying to adapt here during the COVID is, how can we reach out in different ways? Um, uh, certainly when we have some of these limitations, so doing appointments by phone, virtual care, online, um, adopting different kinds of platforms, increasing our education dissemination, um, targeted specifically for uh, substances uh, to various communities, uh, looking at the ECHO model, which is kind of, um, you know, the addictions expertise being trained to other healthcare professionals and advocacy really important for safe spaces and harm reduction, uh, supportive measures. These are some of the, the areas we're really trying to target during this COVID context. And all of that fits within our larger strategy um, for mental health and addictions. And as some of you guys are aware, uh, the Virgo report, um, which was the consultative process um, initiated by our, our current government to say, how can we uh, manage mental health and addictions in a more effective way. I will note that the report did indicate how Manitoba, um, uh, in terms of mental health and addictions, fit, fits about 7.2% of the health budget, um, comparatively to other provinces um, uh, that sit higher at 92 And so we really want to uh, increase funding uh, uh, towards mental health and addictions particularly. And so some of the targeted services um, are the RAM clinics. So that's the rapid access to addiction medicine clinics. And I'll, I'll take a little bit of time because that's an important initiative. But again, our treatment beds, withdrawal management services, improving access to medications and treatments. Um, personally, I was an advocate for uh, helping to uh, get naltrexone and acamprosate for alcohol use disorder more readily available, suboxone and methadone, um, certainly for opioid use disorder. And then how do we work as a uh, more effectively together, not in these silos, right? Where primary care, uh, psychiatric care, acute care um, are, are all doing great work in their their own silo. And so how do we connect these more effectively um, is something that again, in our larger strategy um, has to happen. Offering harm reduction approaches like take home naloxone kits and um, you know how to supervise consumption sites, safe spaces, all these things, maps uh, fit into the that larger picture. And the need to invest in things like families, trauma counseling, uh, education, education, youth, social supports. Um, as I was mentioning, addictions is very uh, complex in all of those ways. So ensuring we're including all of that. So I'll I'll take. Uh, few minutes here to talk about the RAM clinics and then uh, I'll close up and I'm not sure how we're doing for time there. But the RAM clinic is a model that was adopted from the Ontario uh, model of the RAM at the Medify, the Women's uh, College Hospital, Dr. Melden uh, Kahan, who is one who had spearheaded that here. And so AFM has worked uh, very collaboratively with here you'll see four of the five regions we're in the process of working with uh, southern to get our sixth location up um, but we essentially have 
five RAM clinics that in the last year and a half we've um, uh, built up and these are the sites. So you see one in Thompson, one in Brandon, one in Selkirk and two in Winnipeg. Um, and what they are are a site where there's an addictions uh, specialist, a nurse and uh, a counselor um, who work together to do an assessment um, on an individual who presents with a substance use disorder. They make a, a, a plan um, based on their presentation, their assessment, which could include pharmacotherapy and social supports, community-based supports, um, in-hospital, in-house treatment, um, a combination of all of these uh, based on uh, that individual's uh, assessment and uh, their desire in terms of treatment. One key thing is it's a self-referral, so people can just show up. And remember how I said that, meet them where they're at, um, so that timely management um, uh, for them uh, when they need so they can just show up in terms of stigma too. They don't have to see their family doctor and get a referral. And often uh, many patients will tell me, they'll say, you know, I'm coming to you. I didn't want to tell my, you know, family uh, physician or, or, or nurse practitioner. I don't want them to know or my employer or my family. And again, attest to some of that uh, stigma or self-shame that they might uh, hold. And so we work together with them um, along with the rest of the system to get them the right kind of care as opposed to people just presenting in and out to the emergency departments in you know acute withdrawal or acute intoxication presentations. And so um, at the same time, this model is also meant to be um, you know, if, for example, I'm the addiction specialist working in clinic that day, also to help mentoring with the rest of the system and education. So it really has to work collaboratively within the system and not just a dumping ground um, uh, for that. So I like to give the analogy, RAM is one spoke in the wheel. And again, helping to give that evidence-based care in a timely fashion and work in conjunction with the rest of the healthcare system. So here I've kind of, I've put together a little model, as you see, the RAM fits with all of the rest of the organizations, our community health centers, our First Nations community, the regional health authorities, our withdrawal management, the EDs, hospitals, psych and primary care. And so all of them um, uh, interface and, and, and need to work together more effectively so we have uh, a better effective response for addictions. Here, um, I had the opportunity before we started the RAMS to go out and visit in uh, Ontario. That's Dr. Meldon uh, Kahan, who, uh, like I said, spearheaded, uh, spearheaded uh, this initiative. And here is their um, uh, resource center. And you see the, the MEDIFI, which stands for the Mentoring, Education and Clinical Tools for Addiction and Primary Care Hospital Integration. And so they have a lot of valuable resources on there, many of which uh, we have borrowed. And you see the link there on the bottom. Um, here I'm providing you with our um, our website, which is the manitobaaddictionhelp.ca. There's also a 1-800 number if people want to access those to find out which kind of services. If you go to our AFM website, um, many are all listed on there. Uh, and again, even though we are a crown agency and we serve about 90% of the addiction services within Manitoba, um, we also list all of the uh, the uh, as many as the private and nonprofit that are out there. Um, and um, again, here is just kind of talking about the RAM clinics, our sites, and uh, the times for those. So um, if people want to access those, those are uh, certainly available. So when we think about treatment in general, like I said, the RAM, it's not just here's a, a quick solution. We really need to think about um, all of these working pieces and what all we can do. And, you know, whether you're attending this session as someone who's, uh, you know, a grandmother, a grandfather, a daughter, a son, a sister, a brother, a wife, a husband, we all really can play a role and we might not even realize that. This is not something that just affects them, it affects us. And so we need to ensure that we're um, opening those doors so people can feel um, that they're... Uh, they're okay to share and talk about that. And even if you open up conversations or you say, I'm here, you know, I'll, I'll walk with you. That emotional support to enter into that door um, can be the key thing that, that helps uh, to allow people to, to access the care or, you know, I'll attend your appointments or I'm going to be rooting for you. Um, even having that emotional support can go a long, long way. So when we think about stigma hurting, we can all do something about that. Understanding, appreciating addictions as that chronic disease and not just, it's not just a moral decision. Um, uh, while people do make decisions and there's responsibilities around that, there's also, um, as 
I kind of alluded to in this presentation, the biological neuro, uh, neurological uh, components that are happening, and we have to have the compassion towards that and the understanding. And again, every substance affects our body differently. I tried to go through some of those categories so we have a bit of an appreciation um, how they impact a little bit differently in that there's not this cookie cutter solution that just fits for every single individual. And um, we all need connection. You'll hear a lot about, um, and again, when I think about in this COVID context, uh, we really need to feel that support and connection with people. And, you know, when we look at kind of that underlying trauma where some of those disconnects happen quite young, um, we, need, we need to help build that healthy community. And, you know, the beauty is we're all part of the solution. We all can be. So I always say, you, I hope that at the end of any session that I do, everyone learned at least one piece of information and maybe they can reach out to one person or impact one person they might not even know and the world will be a better place. So um, never underestimate the value of what, what you can do when you're, you're doing that good. And at this point, I think I'll open up um, for questions. And I think, Tracy, do you want to? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Pullen. That you're definitely you're you're very knowledgeable and extremely passionate about the topic. So so thank you for all of that. Um, I'm only going to ask just a few questions. I have um, uh, posted a few of them already on the the board that everybody can see. Um, you know, one of them is given the wide body of evidence around the effectiveness of harm reduction. Why does public policy continue to reflect mainly a punitive approach? Yeah, and great question. I think there's a lot of factors that come into play. Um, you know, uh, our system is uh, ran by political, um, uh, a political structure. And so um, there's that component uh, that uh, is involved. When we think about the legal system, um, often they're presented in situations where uh, perhaps there's already been violence uh, that has occurred, could be a fatality, could be other. Um, and so now they're left dealing with this without necessarily having um, the right structure up front. And remember how I was saying, we really need to do the upstream thinking and we need to invest in those areas. So invest in the families, invest in education, invest in healthcare, all that front so we can help prevent. So we're not always just reacting to the issues. And so when we think about the proactiveness in our approach, we need to invest in that and not just in the reactive. And again, a lot of this is, uh, you know, certainly we know the evidence. It's also um, uh, uh, the political, and again, I can't speak to all of that component, but, um, uh, and they're juggling uh, their component, but one of the things that we can do is always advocate, and again, um, uh, as individuals, uh, we all kind of have this responsibility um, to provide that information, and I certainly do that within my context, but um, uh, there is also that uh, political component that comes into play, too, in terms of the larger system uh uh, integration. And so I think this comes up a lot in terms of uh, topic uh, uh, around addictions, right? So when I was kind of mentioning even about um, people's beliefs, it's something that stems so deep within people that whether it was their religious or their cultural view or um, their personal experience, sometimes that holds so strongly that um, we don't always see all of that evidence or we don't appreciate. And that's specifically why I took it into that activity of going through um, experiencing the stigma ourselves because um, we don't always understand it to that depth. And so um, I think we have to continue our efforts to move things uh, forward in that evidence-based fashion. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is, is cannabis a good recommendation or idea for people addicted to harder drugs as a means of harm reduction or eventually moving to sobriety? Okay, and uh, uh, again, another great question because we've heard a lot about that, particularly with opioids um, and, uh, and into ca uh, cannabis. Really important to realize that, and that's, this is one of the questions when I do an assessment. Um, it's not like every substance just fits another substance. They all work into our body very differently. They affect the brain very differently. And so one of the important questions I ask individuals um, when they present is, why are they using? 
some people prefer downers, some people prefer uppers. So when we think of uppers, it's some of the stimulants, downers, it could be alcohol, it could be opioids. Um, if they're doing this to numb a feeling, if they're doing it to feel high, if they're doing it to mask a pain, there could be variable reasons. We have to understand that. We have to have conversations around that. So that way we can plan and decide what is a safe plan around that, which may or may not include um, a harm reduction, including cannabis. So cannabis doesn't, there's no evidence of cannabis um, uh, tapers us off opioids, alcohol, uh, stimulants, whatever the category um, in this question might be. But if someone has, for example, pain or is numbing a feeling, um, if, depending what feeling they get from the cannabis and what they're getting from their substance of choice, it may have um, some ability. And when we look at opioids in particular, opioids work on the opioid receptors and cannabis on the endocannabinoids. So it doesn't sit there and replace on the opioids. So we can't just switch one for one. But um, are we looking at the underlying pain? Are we looking at, the, and when I say pain, it could be emotional pain. It could be, right, many of us might be numbing, um, uh, numbing some negative emotions that we've had from our trauma, from a physical uh, injury, whatnot. And so we have to look at these underlying issues and make that proper assessment to then make a plan around that. But one just substitute for another, just as a cookie cutter solution, evidence is not there for that. Okay, thank you. Maybe just two more questions I'll pose. And some of these, uh, maybe Dr. Poland, you might be able to do some more about one-on-one -on -one as some of them are, are, are specific. Um, another question that was asked was, can you share with us your thoughts about older adults and addictions in general and meth specifically? Yeah. And so um, I think that's a great question because we are seeing as examples um, more sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections in our elderly population. I think sometimes they might not have been uh, provided with all the resources or educated in that area. And kind of a, where I was explaining with, you know, and I chose that, um, you know, well, I used to do THC back in the day. It's not harmful. Again, the products that are available today are very different. And so the risks are that um, you know, someone who might be 80 might have uh, experienced something in their 20s and think it's the same thing when really it's a completely uh, different uh, avenue. And when we think about the elderly's body as we age, and certainly all of us as we age, we metabolize things very differently. And so um, often uh, doses need to be reduced. We have to have different considerations um, along with that. And so um, we do have some guidelines out for elderly, but this is also another population that we have to be a little bit more sensitive to. And we have to open these conversations. There might be added layers of stigma that also exist um, within, uh, within this population that, um, you know, there might have been a zero tolerance or um, specific uh, messaging at their time that exists. And so I think all of these factors are really important factors that come into play when we when we think about um, the elderly population. And so, um, and again, maybe their physical mobility or their resources, they might be isolated, they might be at home alone. And so, you know, the tendency to pick up the drink, for example, or um, whatever they have accessibility to uh, uh, might come at play. And so when I also say about the connection, we need to ensure that we have the right support uh, supports and resources um, uh, for these individuals, so they're they're not left uh, uh, alone and to to no to no resources. And again, maybe they can't read or write uh, due to you know some physical uh, impairment or ability. So those are all important factors. Okay, super. Thank you. Uh, second last question is: Is there a partnership between the AFM and the school divisions for education? And if so, what grade do the presentations begin? Yes. Yeah, so another great question. Um, AFM does have resources. So we have counselors that are embedded into um, some of the school uh, school districts. And so they offer one on one counseling to um, individuals. Uh, so in child in in any grade, um, it might also be that um, if they have a parent who is a substance user and the child needs um, assistance with that. Um, uh, we also have those services. We've got family services, uh, so that way the whole family unit can be connected. And those are all through the AFM uh, counselor base. They are obviously providing uh, education uh, sessions to the individuals, um, mostly in the, the high school or junior high grades. Um, I know I've been asked to uh, speak at the uh, school board. And um, as I said, when you say a lot of the, uh, when you saw our Canadian statistics that say around 16, uh, is when some of those first uses happen. 
as I can speak, uh, you know, to the population that I deal with, sometimes that's as early as seven or nine. So I think the um, education system um, uh, has to have all the will and the ability um, uh, to look at kind of where and the timing of that and AFM work together. I know conversations and like I said, um, uh, these things are happening, um, uh, but to the full depth, we still need more work to be doing that and, and driving that more. Okay, thank you. And the last question is, are you able to share any resources for teens uh, and how cannabis affects the developing brain, whether there's a video or literature or anything like that that, that uh, you could recommend? Yeah, so um, I mean, obviously uh, we can send out specific, but I will tell you, if you go to our AFM website, um, there's a plethora of resources that are available, um, all of the guidelines, um, specific resources for specific substances. Um, there are presentations. A lot of our presentations, we've held some uh, community forums across Manitoba um, targeted for specific things, cannabis, um, uh, fentanyl as an example. You can see those and they're all available and accessible to everyone. So please visit our AFM website. And if you need help, uh, Tracy, maybe we can connect and I can give uh, the direct li links for those. Um, but they are available and please uh, access them. Super, thank you. So we can't ask all the questions and I'm sorry to everyone who did post questions and we can't get to them, but Dr. Pullen, are you open to connecting with people one-on-one -on -one if they have a very specific or more private question? Yeah, absolutely, okay. my pleasure. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so thank you everyone for taking the time to, to be with us. A big thank you, especially to Dr. Poulin for that extremely informative presentation. I think we can all do a clap uh, wherever we are for just that uh, amazing job. And thank you to all of you for, for taking the time to spend with us um, for this session. Um, just to let you know that we will be following up with a survey to gather your feedback and we really do want to see how you thought about the format, how things went, ideas for topics, should we continue this uh, in the future, all those sorts of things and we'd appreciate any feedback, any feedback that you have. And the last thing that I'll mention is that um, we're here again next Wednesday, May the 13th, uh, with Dr. Linda Balnese, and she is an associate professor in our College of Nursing at the U of M. And she's, specific, uh, she's speaking on weeding out fact from fi fiction cannabis use among seniors, which will also be proved to be, I'm sure, a very interesting presentation. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful week, and please stay, please stay safe. Thanks. <laughs>